Welcome everyone and thanks for joining. I'm Laura Ajege, a course lead for the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management program here at MIT CTL. I'm co-hosting this live event with Mr. Kellen Betts and I'm very excited to host it with you, Kellen, as usual. He's also a course lead here at the MicroMasters program. Today, we are also very fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Carnavali joining us. Stephen is an Associate Professor of Supply Chain Management at the College of Business at Florida Atlantic University, and also a Co-Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Purchasing and Supply Management. Welcome, Stephen, and thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks, guys. Should be fun. Awesome. Kellen, the floor is yours to share the agenda of the session. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure to be co-hosting with you again today as well. Um, so for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to discuss with Dr. Carnavale the impact of technologies and what these technologies bring in terms of opportunities and risks to supply chain networks. We're going to explore how some companies are use, using these um, to build resiliency in this newer concept of plasticity in their supply chains. And we'll definitely save time for your questions at the end, so start thinking of those. Um, and please use the webinar Q&A feature. It's that button on the bottom in Zoom there, that Q&A feature in Zoom. And please be sure you're logged in or you have a name in there. We won't be pulling anonymous questions from that Q&A feature. Um, so with that in mind, Stephen, are you ready to kick things off here? It'd be great to hear a little bit more about your background and, and maybe some of the books and some of the other areas that you work in. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it's a problem, though, because you only give us 20 minutes. And if you give a professor a chance to talk, it'll probably take more than that. So I'll, I'll do my best to give you the elevator pitch on everything. But uh, thank you guys for, for inviting me. Um, yeah, so my, my work uh, in supply chain management uh, focuses broadly on risk and network design, um, which means that I'm really curious about how companies band together, set up distribution networks, establish partnerships and things like that. And my research actually about 12, 13 years ago got started with, um, uh, uh, Kevin Bacon, and I know you'd never think you'd actually hear that, but back in the day, there used to be this thing called the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And, uh, you could go in and pick any movie star or person who wrote a movie or anything and see how many links away they were from Kevin Bacon. And, um, so that was actually a network model, which got me interested in thinking about, well, if they could do it for the venerable Kevin Bacon, I wonder if I can take this logic and look at it from the context of supply chains and specifically how companies basically choose their partners. And it evolved a little bit, obviously, away from uh, Kevin Bacon into um, supply chain partnerships. And so my work has gone into uh, looking at the way that these connections exist, so how one firm might be connected to several firms, either first, second, third, or however many tiers back. Um, and what that means for risk. So early on, we started looking at risk from the context of when a disruption happens, let's say third tier back, either at a plant or on a logistics line, how that disruption will propagate or spread uh, downstream. And, and the disruptions initially that everybody thinks about are like, you know, plant goes offline, there's a fire, there's a flood, whatever the case is. But in like we're going to talk about today, there's also information disruptions that can happen. There's also uh, uh, cybersecurity issues that can go wrong. There's financial processing systems. So there's so much to study, but really it all boils down to a strategic decision about how firms choose to design and assemble the connections that exist within their networks. And so that's a, a kind of a really high level perspective on what I focus on. Some stuff that I've done lately, I've uh, been looking into cybersecurity risk. We've been doing some work into uh, intellectual property and the risks that that poses. And basically, when we think about it, aside from looking at it from the network standpoint, we also think about it in the way to organize, you know, how risks uh, or how firms can plan for risks is typically we say that it'll fall into three different uh, phases of planning. Uh, we'll think about strategies to mitigate the risk, knowing that it's going to happen, um, thinking about strategies to deal with the uh, recovery on the downstream end of things. Um, and then on the front end of things, thinking about the detection. So detection, mitigation, recovery. We know it's going to happen. How do we figure it out? We know it's going to happen. How do we kind of stop the bleeding when it occurs? And then because it has happened, how do we kind of bounce back? And so all of that transitioned into the work. It kind of culminated, I guess, is a way you could say it, uh, into the work that we're doing now on this new topic around supply chain plasticity, 
which is kind of the next evolution, I would say. You know, it's the industry 5.0 to the 4.0 analog to um, disruptions and ca resilience, adaptability, all this kind of stuff. And now we're thinking about, all right, this is the next evolution. Um, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about that. But hopefully that was a relatively concise yet comprehensive overview of the things that uh, I'm curious about. Awesome, Stephen. And I, I think it's very exciting and we have a lot to learn from you. And I also love that you brought that anecdote on how you got into this because I'm always a huge supporter on how many things we can do with the tools we learn from network design and the multiple uses we can do uh, with that. Um, so I would like to start with focusing on your uh, supply chain risk management uh, background and thinking on the recent global disruptions like the pandemic years ago, the conflict in Ukraine, uh, drought on Panama Canal, um, the ever given getting stuck and multiple others. Um, we want to learn more because we have heard a lot of resilience, but probably we haven't heard that much about plasticity. So would you give us some background to establish a common language now for all our audience on um, what's the difference between those concepts and a little bit more on plasticity to move on to the next questions. Yeah. So basically, when you look at the landscape of stuff you can do around supply chain risk management, and stuff is a technical term, by the way, but when you look at all the things that you can do strategically, words come up like adaptability, agility, resilience, responsiveness, all this kind of stuff. And it's basically saying one kind of sliver of the same thing. It's all a different part of the meal that we're trying to eat to prepare for uh, dealing with chaos that will happen in supply chains. And so when, when we started getting into this topic, there wasn't very much done in the academic literature. The, the idea of plasticity comes from neuroplasticity, where you know your brain can rewire the neurons and the connections based on some kind of stimuli. And so when the idea of plasticity was first launched, and to date, there's only three academic papers that actually have language on it. Uh, soon, once we get ours published, it'll be a fourth. But basically, it talks about the ability of a supply chain or supply network to rapidly reconfigure and create some type of a change. So things like agility deals with responding to. So when I have a disruption happens, the, the way I design my supply network, I can respond to it. Um, things like um, Resiliency is the ability to bounce back and get to a pre-disruption state. But the the thing behind it is when you look at all the different dimensions, it all assumes basically going back to the point that you started from where you were operating at normal capacity. But the idea is, do we really want to go back to that same point? If we got hit with this disruption, it really damaged us. So plasticity kind of takes these concepts and it brings in this idea of responsiveness, which is to say when you break down what exists in, in terms of firm strategy, there's a number of different dimensions. Agility is one of them. But plasticity is the ability at a network level. It's a network level phenomenon to be able to look at how a network is designed, a supply network is designed, and, and establish best practices around knowing a disruption is going to happen, being able to reconfigure, either taking some stimulus in and reconfiguring ahead of time, and then being able to respond when these things happen in the future. And so some early examples that give the idea of plasticity some merit are you know, Cisco Systems has this sense and response system where they're constantly gathering information and then they're making actions or decisions based on this. So they might move, for example, inventory from one portion of their supply network that's going to be susceptible or likely to be susceptible to some risk, and they might reposition it to another point in the supply chain or supply network where it's less vulnerable to maintain uptime. Because at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're trying to increase on time in full and increase accuracy and quality of inventory. The other hand, though, the other part of that is you can do all of these things in unlimited fashion if you have all the money in the world. You can spend money and make sure you have 100% fulfillment rates, 100% service levels, but there's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off with respect to cost. So the idea is if I'm going to pull back and I'm going to invest in resources or invest, invest resources into this notion of supply chain um risk management at the highest level of generality, what's the best way to, what is the most optimal way 
to spend that money in a way that strategically benefits long-term performance. So that's kind of the idea of plasticity. It's this ability to rapidly reconfigure. So it's a network level phenomenon and much of the work in the past hasn't really talked about at least explicitly this network level phenomenon. And you know, the academic side of things, we get into some nuts and bolts about what network structures change and things like that outside the scope of today, but certainly that kind of is the academic rigor that underpins uh, what we're doing. And, you know, the practical um, insight of all this, uh, or rather, I should say the practical application of all this, the examples that you gave are excellent. How do you pivot and shift and and respond to global disruptions? You know, there's this pendulum in procurement we always talk about, and you've heard it a lot too, just in time, just in case, right? So we went from having just in case over inventory back to just in time, single lot sizing, a disruption like the pandemic hits, we have to stock more inventory, but now we're going back. So is that the best strategy or is there a better way to move forward? That's kind of the, those are sort of the tentacles of, of how we've been thinking about plasticity. Awesome. Well, thank you. It's a fascinating concept. Um, it also kind of aligns, so my background is actually in neuroscience. And so it's funny that it comes from that concept um, that you pull there from neuroscience or or neuroplasticity. Um, it also kind of seems to combine I think, two powerful concepts that we often talk about in supply chain, you know, like business continuity on the one hand, and then also like this continuous improvement. There's like a long history in business operations with continuous improvement. So it kind of combines those two. And we often hear like a lot about resilience and how we bounce back, but it makes sense to bounce back better, right? Why not improve um, and, and uh, bounce back better, if you will. Awesome. So I want to dive in maybe kind of start the discussion um, building on that, this kind of like that framework, if you will, into talking about some disruptions. You know, we often hear about a lot of high profile disruptions. We, you know, Laura mentioned a couple of examples. Um, one topic that I know you mentioned earlier and that uh, seems to be coming up a lot more recently, especially since the kind of like the pandemic, post pandemic uh, era, if you will, mm -hmm. we hear a lot about cybersecurity and some of these risks, you know, and I've been reading a lot of uh, corporate SEC reports and it seems to be a very frequent con uh, topic that they're reporting in those, you know, just standardized um, public disclosure reports. So I'm wondering from like a risk management perspective, you know, if you could build on that, you know, we have a lot of new technologies coming to supply chain, you know, robots and warehouses and these kinds of things. You know, could you, you know, discuss what you're seeing in this space and what cybersecurity looks like? Um, and then maybe also connected to this concept of plasticity. All right. So if you think about plan, source, make, deliver, return, one of the organizing frameworks to think about what a supply chain is when someone says, hey, what is it? And you don't want to go, I don't know, you know, Amazon boxes. If you think about those buckets, the the plan source, um, or rather, excuse me, the source make deliver aspects, you can really drill down and see where the cybersecurity risks exist. And one of the most salient examples as of late has been machinery that is IoT or smart enabled being produced in potentially um, threatening countries and being utilized at port infrastructure in the United States. So one recent uh, Wall Street Journal article highlighted this where it was the cranes and forklifts and uh, stuff movers, again, another technical term, I'm throwing technical terms at everybody like crazy, but the, the, the machinery at the ports, if it's IoT enabled and if it has a sensor and an access to an internet, it can be hacked and maliciously so uh, by potentially negative or malicious actors, as, as I said. And so this is a big cybersecurity concern, because if you think about it, aside from the mega global disruptions that we've alluded to before, this one micro disruption, if, if the port, for example, if it's the port of Los Angeles or Long Beach or port of Everglades near where I'm at, and there's an interruption in service because the machine's been taken over or damage has been caused, that creates a cascading disruption, not just with inventory that has landed and needs to get distributed out, but also inbound inventory. I mean, consider what happened with COVID when the ports uh, got shut down, empty containers couldn't go back to bring new stuff in. That caused inventory issues like crazy. But then consider if, the con if, if stuff's coming in, then you have a backlog of, of containers basically sitting in the ocean. That's crazy expensive too. That that causes a lot of disruptions as well. So the the cybersecurity end of things exists uh, uh, at that importing side of things on the logistics side. The cybersecurity concerns certainly exist in the manufacturing space. When you think about automated production, when you think about 
uh, computer assisted designs and really high tech drawings when you're collaborating with when you have plant production sites or or uh, facilities across the world and you're using the internet to collaborate back and forth you're sharing information high level patent documents so then you open up to things like corporate espionage so it, it's crazy because the cybersecurity um, angle is something that previously was housed within IT you know that was it just sat within the IT side of things and it was how do i ensure my systems from breach from the outside but then you take the example that really started this for me and a couple of colleagues which was the target cybersecurity breach this was something where a supplier was hacked because they didn't spend the 40 bucks or whatever it was on the premium antivirus they were an hvac contractor to a local target retailer when they needed to get paid they got paid through the ERP system, so they had to get into Target's ERP system. That created a point of entry, which led to the chaos that happened. So it can happen on the downstream side of things, on the upstream side of things. But the idea is that now cybersecurity is inextricably linked to supply chain. And so, you know, we did a book on cybersecurity and supply chain, and we talked, uh, there was a lot of edited chapters about various practices and how blockchain might improve things. But what it comes down to is just basic cyber hygiene. And really what that means is training. And so how does this lead into plasticity? From the plasticity side of things, uh, it's a little bit easier to configure technology to rapidly change because you can algorithmically uh, using AI, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, the panacea of all uh new technology, but you can have algorithms that that basically rebound, shift, augment capacity, uh, and, and move things around to be able to operate and respond to these things a priori, you know, ahead of time instead of post hoc after the fact. So the biggest takeaway from the cybersecurity and supply chains is it's not just an IT thing. This is a, a absolutely a supply chain management concern across all functions. And we don't have time to get into each one, but it's a big deal across all functions uh, of the supply chain, I would say. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that. I love the fact that you brought a different perspective about cybersecurity. As you said, most of us probably have that in mind in terms of it's IT thing, they are going to take care of that. Um, but it's great to know that if I'm creating any kind of risk matrix about implementing a new project, implementing a new software or a new technology, this is definitely one aspect I want to have in that matrix. So I think uh, this is also for, for our audience an interesting in insider takeaway. So you a little bit uh, mentioned that, but I also know that in previous discussions or talks that you have given, um, you have made a reference to the implications of machine learning and artificial intelligence on firms being able to detect, mitigate, recover, or even get better, improve after um, a disruption by using machine learning or AI. So would you expand a little bit more on that idea and all the opportunities you find into using machine learning and AI and of course, if you want to talk about also about the risks or the increased awareness of other um, threats, and that could also be interesting for our audience. Sure. Um, so I think it's funny when people think AI, and, and I'm sometimes guilty of this. Uh, it's automatically like ah, Chat GPT, you know, or or whatever Google calls their 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 AI system, but. What's the value of AI in supply chain? I think you can answer it with one word. It's it's the scale. So often is the case that we in supply chain have problems that get really complex really quickly. And you know, over the past 60 or 70 years from the operations research or math modeling side of things, we've been able to figure out heuristics to be able to solve and optimize many things that we do. You know, one classic example is um, network planning. So if we're trying to figure out what to locate or how, where to locate which facilities based on a number of different criteria, previously, we might have to reduce the problem down to one that's, you know, linear or easier to be able to handle through traditional computation. And we're not quite at obviously quantum computation, but when you have large scale data that becomes really complex and you can systematize the way in which you solve these problems, this is where AI, machine learning, all the higher tech, uh, let's say, implementations of these, of these tools can be really helpful. 
That's a general answer. A specific answer is things like when you've got copious mountains of data and you need to be able to sift through it to be able to generate actionable insights. You know, before we were doing things like data mining in a relatively trimmed down way. It was complex for the time, but now with uh, machine learning and high, and high powered computing, the insights that you can generate, I mean, you can take something from a consumer side of things, uh, transactions on a retail site like Amazon or whatever, and you can mine that, figure out patterns and make actionable insights through dashboards or whatever tool that are so targeted, that are so precise that you can make managerial decisions to invest that money in a much better way. So this is where, you know, anytime that there exists um, uh, repeated or frequencies of interactions that that could be otherwise automated, that's where AI, machine learning, high tech stuff becomes really useful. From the risk side of things, uh, we all experience this and you can connect the cyber to what we're talking about pretty easily. So I use a tool for my personal um, identity protection that uses artificial intelligence that scans basically the whole internet, uh, as far as I understand it, and it looks at any time that there's a transaction that might have my name or some other identifier. It also looks at every single transaction that I make, you know, because I give it permission to do so, and it signals to me if there's um, uh, a transaction that's irregular, and it alerts me to it, or it can stop it ahead of time. And then banks, financial institutions, anytime there's money on the line, they use AI to be able to do anomaly detection. You can take those same trans uh, those same logics <clears throat> and look at supply chain transactions and see if there's a possibility to automate. So basically, the connection between, and, and then the examples are, are infinite, right? Logistics automation, warehouse automation, robotic scheduling within facilities, um, production time scheduling, bin packing problems, any of these hardcore issues that need to be automated whereby efficiency is the key criterion on which we optimize, AI has the potential to facilitate human decision-making in ways that maybe we haven't seen before. And um, the trick I think is, uh, not the trick I would say, but the key insight is thinking about how these digitalization and AI tools can be utilized to aid decision making rather than to make the decision. It's kind of like the analogy of if I have a question and I go to Google and I can ask Google that question, do I trust the first or do I take as gospel the first result on Google? Probably not. I'm going to use that as a starting point to verify and triangulate my data. Imagine though how much is on Google and it pulls it down to one page. AI, machine learning, and the tools like that, they can do the same thing by, by bringing all of these to the forefront and organizing the information in such a way that it reduces the human uh, task time. And those same analogies can happen across the board and supply chain. Um, supplier selection, facilitated decision-making on contract management, um, costing and contracting, all, all these kind of things are really big, but that's where it is, it, it, where, where the future I think is going or already is perhaps taking these routine decisions and optimizing them for human decision-making, be that on the risk side or uh, on the manufacturing side, I would say. Awesome. There's clearly lots of opportunity for those who are interested in that intersection, you know, AI or, or machine learning and these, these new technologies and supply chain for sure. Um, and one of the things that strikes me, and I want to maybe kind of connect these two discussions on cybersecurity and AI and machine learning is maybe the risks behind these models, you know, so like in the consumer space, we often hear about like the bias in the model, you know, or the, you know, the poisoning attacks with these gen AI tools, those kinds of things. I'm wondering if you've heard any or have like any examples or have heard any of the risks on the supply chain side? Like, is there a way where these models that are making these decisions or that are aiding supply chain operators? Um, is there like a cybersecurity risk behind the model itself? Um, have you given any examples you've heard of there? I think the old maxim of garbage in, garbage out still holds true, maybe now more so than ever. So you've got on the one hand, this benefit of more data than we've ever had before, the ability to organize, disseminate, access, uh, whatever synonym or adjective you'd like to use around which we can handle these data. At the same time, the question is, how do we make sense of it? So it's beyond the, the stretch of human computational ability to deal with it all. So we delegate or we outsource that to artificial intelligence. Okay, going back to that, do we 
how do we utilize AI to make these decisions? That's the biggest risk. And it's not necessarily explicitly a cyber risk or a tech risk or whatever. It's leveraging, thinking about it as a tool to be able to utilize in supply chain decision making. So how have malicious actors been utilizing these? It's a question of humans taking digitalization, putting it everywhere we can in the supply chain, and then delegating out those decisions and actions to the technology. That opens up a vulnerability for, for hacking, for malicious actors. I mean, here's a silly example. Let's say I'm running produce on a truck across the country, and I have IoT sensors that are sensing like the amount of gas that's being kicked off by the vegetables to see if there's if they're going off or something like this. If I were a malicious actor, and I'm, you know, I mean, this is kind of like Robert Grisham's spy novel type stuff, but could I get into that IoT sensor and manipulate the data and say, no, everything's fine. And by the time that shipment arrives, it's actually bad. Or could I disrupt the truck that's the that's self-driving if that ends up being in the case? And can I derail it if I don't have protections in place? So I think the, the whole point is, as I'm thinking about cyber and it relates to supply chain applications, let's just say on the logistics, on the freight side of things, where are the opportunities for disruption? That's where I need to hedge and really plan for those mitigation strategies. The other thing I think it really goes back to is training. It's training the personnel who are procuring the AI application into whatever the application is to be able to think what these vulnerabilities are, what these risks are, so that when I'm onboarding a new tech, when I'm onboarding a supplier, when the process of me actually incorporating these technologies into my operations, I know what the risks to look at are. And, and you know, you can take another example of like automated warehousing or something like this. These are really excellent applications of AI. You know, the old Kiva robots that were optimizing, um, or rather were, were picking and packing for Amazon, they were built on a grid, kind of a Manhattan grid system. Well, if you get in and hack this system and you have bots running in and the crash detection isn't there anymore, that's a huge disruption. Uh, anytime you delegate to an IoT censored issue, this opens up a point of vulnerability. And, you know, you can go on and on with these applications and the manufacturing and the automated manufacturing side of things. If you don't have security protections in place that govern how the manufacturing is done, you can imagine the issues that'll that'll arise there. You know, will have a car with five doors attached to the hood instead. You know, I mean, you can think about the crazy examples. So the whole point is, if there's an opportunity for malevolence, this is likely a point of vulnerability to hedge for. But then you have to balance out. How much cost am I willing to invest in mitigating these risks relative to the likelihood of those risks happening? So it's funny. The, the more and more advanced we get with the tech and with the digitalization, some of the old actuarial calculations around cost benefit, again, just like data in, data out, they hold true now more than ever. The question is, do we utilize AI to do the cost benefit, right? So it's it's like this... It's like this loop. Anyway, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. The point is, if you organize all these elements of the supply chain, the more the degree to which you automate, the degree to which you increase the level of digitalization raises specific concerns around risk mitigation because new, potentially unforeseen risks pop up. So how do you protect them? And a lot of people will say, well, you can in do insurance and uh, all this and that. I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with like an extended warranty on a vehicle. There's exclusions in every insurance policy, right? So you've got to be careful with those things too. Anyway, point is there's new vulnerabilities as AI and digitalization and, and tech increases. They open up new vulnerabilities across the spectrum uh, of plan, source, make, deliver, return. Um, and it's something that has to be taken into account, I think. Awesome. So uh, I love that you brought into our attention the human factor and, and the need to be ready for uh, uh, implementing this kind of tools. So it's not about just thinking about the increased productivity, but the trade-offs, but being ready of um, considering all the risks around that and, and, and not creating greater harm than making it better as we expect uh, with that implementation. So thank you for bringing that to the floor. Um, so before we're jumping into the Q&A session from the audience, I want some advice from you. So most of the audience here today is taking our MicroMasters program in supply chain management. Others may be new to SEM or just growing in this path of the supply chain journey. 
Um, I would love to know what's your advice for those that are shaping themselves as a supply chainer or growing this passion and what's worth for them to keep on their radar right now with all this technology and new information we are bringing to the table throughout this supply chain journey. Well, I think being here is an excellent start and and the MicroMaster credential is an excellent one to to learn about a really comprehensive introduction on supply chain management. But I think the the one tenant that everybody would agree on is the pace of development in supply chain is just insane. So keeping up with what's going on is critical. Some great websites are like Supply Chain Brain, Supply Chain Dojo, all these websites that just have new information out there about all the different trends happening. Um, webinars that companies offer, um, you know, of course, uh, uh, participating in these webinars around what are the new developments, what kind of technologies out there. And it's a matter of getting perspectives from across the board, because frankly, it, by the time we're done with this, there's going to be 15 articles on LinkedIn talking about the next revolution of supply chain management, probably. So it's a matter of immersing yourself in what's going on. I mean, it's easy for me to say I'm an academic. My job is to immerse. But um, I think, thankfully, because of the internet, there are so many opportunities to just figure out and learn the new best things. And then the final thing I would say is I tell my, a lot of my students this here at FAU, if you're looking to transition into a new career, there's a ton of networking events and opportunities at companies or, uh, you know, uh, companies who host networking events, just go and talk. And, you know, the, my, my mom used to give me the advice. You have two ears and one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you learn. I realize that's ironic as I've been asked here to talk, but the point of the matter is, you know, asking questions and then really listening um, and, and constantly developing. That would be what I would say. So credential up, learn as much as you can formally or informally, take advantage of the free resources that exist uh, uh, online or, you know, through LinkedIn or whatever. Um, and, and just try and apply that and figure out what the North Star is. And uh, also with caution, right? Take everything with a grain of salt, including from me, verify everything because anyone has a platform online, they can say anything they want about supply chain or whatever. So definitely take it with a grain of salt, you know, trust, but verify. And uh, yeah, and I think just stay engaged for sure. Awesome. Thank you. That's great advice for our audience out there, our learners out there as well as just more of the broader audience for sure as well. Um, so with that, I think we're going to pull some questions here from our audience. We definitely have some questions there in the Q&A that we want to get to. Um, and please, again, use that Q&A feature if you have any questions and bring those in there. I see a few like hand raised or anything like that. And we're not going to we're not going to bring anybody up on stage. So please use that Q&A feature for those questions. Uh, maybe the first one I'll pull here for, from Anderson. It kind of builds on some of our earlier conversation about like resiliency and plasticity, those the difference there. And this question is, does plasticity, um, is it refer to like optimizing um, or bouncing back after disruption or is it establishing strategies beforehand um, to mitigate, you know, possible disruptions from occurring, I guess, is, is one way I would mm. rephrase this question. And then the second and then part of that is what, how do you consider, like what disruptions do you consider relevant in that assessment, if you will? So to the first question, it's, it's both because it's focusing on what are the strategies around network design that can lead to improvements when a disruption happens? Okay, so the first part is if I'm configuring, it's almost like um, stress testing in some sense. It's stress testing a network for if a point goes down, what will happen? And then how do we respond to that ahead of time? That's the first thing. So it's thinking about what are best practices around network to network design such that when a disruption hits, we will optimize and be able to recover and then go get better. The other part is it's looking back to say, okay, did what we just did work appropriately in order to be able to do what we wanted it to do? So in, in our research, the first part is looking at, does it does this concept really exist? And then if it does, do we see performance improvements? And we looked at uh, downtime and we've seen positive improvements to downtime by shifting networks in response to a disruption. The second part that we're going to get into, we haven't got into yet, is looking into behavioral aspects of what drove the decision. And we don't know anything about that yet, but we're starting to get kind of insights from these data points indicating that 
it, it's more of a response driven phenomenon, whereas it might be, or it should be perhaps more of a thinking about it ahead of time. So that's the bit of the first question. In terms of what types of disruptions, it can be anything, right? So you can define a disruption however is appropriate for the context that you're looking at. If you are in the financial services, a disruption could be my office is located in Jersey City. I'm looking to connect to the New York Stock Exchange across the river. If the underwater cable got disrupted, that's a disruption. Do we have a redundancy strategy or some other way to be able to minimize latency to connect? It could be something uh, like a factory being shut down. And would the classic strategy of having a redundant practice or splitting inventory or splitting production, does that make sense from a stress testing standpoint? So it can be whatever disruption that's appropriate uh, or relevant to um, the focal company that you're looking at or the industry and it's service industry or uh, physical production. Thank you, Stephen. And, and I think as everything, as you mentioned, there are a couple of uh, great truth in supply chain like the uh, that we use like the data uh, the garbage in and garbage out or as you said like it's an infinite probably loop into implementing getting feedback did it work how can we make it better and 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 this improvement opportunities at all times uh, and bouncing back and forth um, so there are plenty of questions probably we will not get to all of them but I wanted to combine a couple of them um, they are all considering on how to proceed when it comes to implementing this kind of tools that you have talked about in terms of AI, machine learning, automation. Um, what are the challenges sort of barriers that companies in general, probably not the huge company, but a, a regular average company, um, what are the kind of challenges and barriers that they face? And also if you would suggest based on your research or experience, a gradual implementation, if it if you should consider the maturity of the company or of the business, or is there something else to consider? Yeah, I think one of the things, so the problem is, this all sounds great. How on earth do we test it? And you can't just simulate a disruption to a production line by, you know, starting a factory fire. That's bad advice. Don't do that. One tool that's popped up in the digitalization space has been digital twins. So tools that you can model your actual supply network as comprehensive as you have data for and simulate what would happen if a disruption were to occur. There was a great example I read about recently. I think it was, I know it was NVIDIA and I believe it was Frito-Lay where they were using a digital twin to map the production line to see what capacity constraints exist. And if based on forecasts, whether or not the current capacity of the production line was appropriate. That's one example to see, would there be a disruption in production if, if demand increased? So that uh, example can be utilized across multiple industries. So you can use, run these simulations on networks using a variety of tools to do what if scenarios to, you know, you on Excel, you can run Monte Carlo Markov chain simulations at uh, multiple iterations on a personal computer just to see whether or not if this disruption occurs, will it cause a problem? And not only if, then what, but under what circumstances, how big will these disruptions occur? So there's tools, I think, at many levels. Obviously, the big companies have the resources to be able to make digital twins. Smaller companies might be too early stage to do that. But at that mid-sized space, you know, hiring a supply chain consultant who is experienced in digital twins or uh, looking for, for digital twin tools to map networks and analyze flow and then pull out a node to see what happens. These are ways to implement uh, these type of tools, I think. And especially where with AI and chat GPT and other tools out there, there's uh, probably resources that uh, you can do what if scenarios. I mean, you know, I, yeah, I think that's how what I would say. The digital twin angle is really valuable in, in analyzing this sort of stuff. That's awesome. I think there's another question in here um, from, um, Guatam, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, about basically how do you model um, these risks within supply chain networks? And so hopefully that answers that, that question there. Um, you know, digital twin, the powerful technology. We hear a lot of companies talk about it, but it seems like the adoption is also a little bit slow for some reason as well. So, and I'm wondering maybe just maybe just to build on that, that same concept, how does AI or machine learning connect with digital twins? Like, is, is like, where's the, is there an application there? And how would AI come into the picture or machine learning where? Um, come into the picture with digital twins. Yeah, it's on the predictive side of things. So if you if you build the digital twin and you figure out what risks you want to model, whatever they may be, 
um, you can run multiple scenarios and try to derive predictive insights for what if analysis. So the capacity example I gave you, you can have different, you know, you could run, uh, let's say capacity is 100,000 units per day. You could run in increments of 1,000 from 100 up to 500, and you could see the cutoff points to look at when does stuff really go off the rails and how do we plan for that? And so the machine learning and AI side of things is the predictive space. It's looking at not just what will happen now, but what might happen in the future. And it's the ability to run through these scenarios at such a rapid pace and at such rapid volume that you get insights and you can then take those insights and, and you know, something as simple as looking at a graph over time or where you have on the y-axis, whatever that, um, it could be capacity, it could be dis sites disrupted, whatever, and then the risk on the bottom or over time. So, so you have multiple different ways you can present scenarios and then organize those data to make conclusions and actions based on that. Thanks for bringing a lot of scenario planning on the importance that that brings. And I think this is also a little bit aligned with one question we got from the audience. So it's great because every answer that you provide, it's also answering many more questions that are coming in. So I guess our audience is really engaged into, into the insights they are, get, they are getting from you. Um, so one of the question is a little bit more specific on how to measure and track resilience and plasticity. So probably the scenarios will give us an insight on where we are and where we want to be um, and, and, and the different disruptions and impacts that could happen. But then how to measure that? And is there an easy indicator like a KPI we could use for that, if any? So on the plasticity side of things, the concept is so new, um, we're just trying to establish scientifically that exists. So I'm going to put that aside. On the risk management and resilience side of things, there's been a number of different measures. So the most general measure would be performance and how you break that down is really contingent on the scenario. So time to recover is one that's often utilized in terms of how well the system that you put in place dealt with the disruption. So um, number of weeks down or number of inventory units down. So how long did it take? So that's one. How long did it take you to recover from the time the disruption hit until when you're back operating at what you were before? Um, uh, financial costs relative to the investment. I mean, there's a number of different ways to measure it. The, the measurement is contingent on the scenario that you're looking to optimize. So it's different for a production centric firm versus a service firm. If you're if you're Amazon Web Services, you're probably measuring resilience in terms of latency or downtime. If you're um, Frito-Lay, you're probably looking at units of production or Toyota looking at units of production. You could also be looking at, you know, um, inventory or other classic supply chain measurements is really no one specific way because you define it based on the scenario that you're looking to optimize for. And I'll get back to you on plasticity. Maybe on the next webinar, I'll let you know what we found on that. Yeah, we definitely have to bring you back um, and, and discuss that research for, for sure when it comes out. Um, awesome. So I want to maybe one more time for one more question, Laura, if we have, have time. I want to kind of connect a couple of questions I see here in the in the, uh, the q and also some maybe some concepts you discussed earlier. We've discussed a lot about like AI and machine learning and with Gen AI tools like ChatGPT, that seems to be like the, the hot item right now just in terms of the kind of the global discussion, but there's a lot of other technologies out there that are potentially disruptive from a, an opportunity standpoint, but also from a risk standpoint as well. So like in the Q&A feature here, we have one, uh, Hassan, who mentions brain computer interfaces. We also have another question um, mentioning an add to manufacturing. So that's something that's been around for a while, but it's also potentially very disruptive as well. And then earlier you mentioned blockchain. So there's lots of other technologies. So I'm wondering if you, to maybe comment on what other technologies do we need to have on our radar and we need to be thinking about um, that will present opportunities in the future or in the near future, maybe a longer term future for supply chain professionals? That's a good one. Um, I think as far as the most concrete stuff that exists now for making actionable decisions, it's making the efficiency with which we utilize data and derive conclusions from data uh, better. So anytime you've got, you know, you talk about data lakes and data streams and data pools, anytime you can utilize those and the tools that can analyze those data and run scenario planning or actionable insights, any way to make those better improves performance typically, provided that you don't do the paralysis of analysis thing. As far as moving forward into what's going to come up, 
data and analyzing data and presenting options from which, or rather from data for which conclusions can be made, from which conclusions can be made, that's all going to rely on how people make decisions. So any time to get into the behavioral intent or the behavioral underpinnings of what people do with data, you know, we did a project a number of years back looking at top level communication as far as risk measurements on front level procurement professionals. And we found that people have these risk thermometers. So that's one example of uh, an unconventional way to think about the interface of supply chain and risk because it incorporates a human element. The real human element moving forward is at what point do options around data become overwhelming? And how do we deal with the paralysis of analysis? So, so do we have a new AI tool that helps reduce down the number of options from the number of options that were reduced? Um, I'm not too familiar with the brain computer interface. I'd love to learn about something like that. But basically, I think the question's getting at behavioral intent coupled with artificial intelligence or, or at least technological uh, improvement. So anytime you can figure out how and why people make decisions, and then you couple that with increased efficiency and in technology on decision making, that's how you move forward. The, the question is, do you train an AI to do that or do you use those insights to train a human? And I think it's probably a little bit of both. They're going to work together. The net net of everything here is that everything we've talked about are tools that facilitate decision making. I don't know that we're ever going to fully delegate to AI. And if that point happens, we're talking like Skynet, Terminator level chaos, in which case AI will be doing this webinar, not me and you guys. So I don't know about that, but I think that's really the, the net net of it all. It's the combination of tech and human insight to be able to make better decisions moving forward. Thank you. And I think that's perfect for wrapping up this event. So we talked a lot about technology and the uses we can make, but we also consider the fact that you need to stay tuned to the news in supply chain. You need to to keep up the pace, as Steven mentioned before. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, in an interesting uh, of time, we're wrapping it up. Uh, but Steven, is there any final words you want to give our audience, even in, around the topic or your passion about supply chain? No, I think, um, uh, first of all, thanks for, for having me. This was really fun. And I'm glad that there were so many people joining. Um, I think uh, staying up to date is absolutely necessary because this stuff changes so rapidly. And I think it's an inevitable concept, rather not inevitable consequence. It's an inevitability that tech and AI and digitalization are going to continue to dominate the world of supply chain. So um, the more I can learn, the better. So it's not just me talking to everybody. If anybody has something to tell me that I didn't cover, you know, find me on LinkedIn or whatever. I'm happy to talk about it. So other than what I've said, nothing more to add. Just a big thank you to everyone for listening to me uh, blather on for a little bit. This was really fun. And we have so much more to learn from you that we hope to have you in a future season of webinars here on the MicroMasters. So hopefully you will be back. Um, and thank you, Kellen. It was great to co-host with you once again. It's always great to have you around. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Great to co-host with you again. And Dr. Carnavale for your time today. For sure, we're going to have to bring you back and discuss some of these topics in the future for sure. Great. Awesome. And to the audience, this is just the first webinar in the season. So stay tuned for the upcoming one. Um, and of course, uh, just double check the chat for the links to enroll in our program. SEC 2X and Forex are open for enrollment and there's some coupon code around. Uh, so hopefully I'll see you all uh, around in the next one. Thank you everyone for joining.